To prove his hypothesis, he designed a simple experiment. In a receptacle, he mixed hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and water vapor, the gases which, according to the studies of Oprin and Haldane, were the components of the first atmosphere of planet Earth. Miller subjected this mixture to a treatment of repeated electric shocks. Days later, his suspicions were confirmed. He had obtained amino acids, the organic compounds necessary to form the proteins which make up cells. Miller had managed to produce organic molecules, taking us to the threshold of life. But his experiments did not reveal the secret of biogenesis. The step from non-life to life remains a chemical mystery that depends in part on our answer to this question. What do we mean by life? What exactly is life? How can we know if a material object is alive or inert? The answer to this question seems quite obvious. We look at the rocks or the scorching sands of the desert, and we know we are looking at inanimate matter. We see the animals and have no doubt that they are living beings. We perceive that they have a specific shape. We know that they breathe, feed themselves, and have sexual relations to reproduce. In other words, they are entities with specific limits, which use their energy in an ordered manner and are capable of reproduction. But these specifications are not necessarily reliable for defining life. A flame could be considered as having specific limits in the same way as animals and plants. It also consumes energy in an ordered manner and is even capable of reproduction. Nevertheless, we would not call it a living organism. There are two properties of life that must happen to lead to the modern day world. One is metabolism. Metabolism is the ability to take energy and atoms from the surrounding and build molecules, build the structures of life. The second is information, biological information or genetics. And for modern genetics, you need DNA and RNA. You need to have that protein system. Now, philosophers differ. Which came first, metabolism or genetics? My prejudice is the first step is metabolism, because you need to get atoms, you need to get energy, you need to build structures. And then as those structures get more complex, you make the structures more efficient by having a genetic mechanism. Today it is recognized that even the most basic form of life requires self-replicating RNA or DNA. The language of life is written with four letters, corresponding to the four nucleotides which make up the sequence. The way to read this codified message is identical for all living beings. This molecule contains all the information necessary for making an organism and for the organism to carry out its functions. But what happens if this message is deposited in an organism that does not know how to decipher it? Viruses are made of the same essential proteins and nucleic acids which are found in all living organisms. They contain genetic information stored in DNA or RNA molecules, but they do not carry out metabolic functions and are not capable of reproduction unless they are situated inside a cell. Some hypotheses attribute the origin of viruses to the degeneration of bacteria, which at some time formed a symbiosis with specific cells. According to other theories, viruses are stray genes which have been transferred to cells of a different species by virtue of some kind of accident of nature. The most likely explanation, however, is that viruses are the result of the intermediate stages in the process of evolution from molecules to the first microbes.
Whatever their origin, it is generally accepted that we cannot consider viruses as living beings. They are rather an example of something that could have occurred between non-life and life. Since the definition of life is such a slippery problem, scientists are focusing their efforts on examining environments with the kind of extreme conditions in which life emerges. This is the Tinto River, in the southeast of the Iberian Peninsula, 90 kilometers of reddish-colored waters, which the ancient Phoenicians called the River of Fire. Its present appearance is the result of the mining activity which has been carried out in the region for over 5,000 years. These waters show elevated levels of acidity and contain high concentrations of metals which are extremely toxic for life. Surprisingly, the Tinto River is a paradise for a wide variety of organisms. These waters are swimming with microorganisms which feed off the abundance of metallic sulfides found here in order to perform their metabolic functions. They produce energy from the iron and sulfur which they encounter. They do not need oxygen to live. You could say that they chew up the stones and eliminate the waste. The first research that was carried out in this surprising environment revealed the existence of what biologists know as prokaryotic organisms. These beings have a very primitive structure with no nucleus and barely developed subcellular organs. Each year we're finding that, that life is, is able to fit into more and more extreme environments. And right now we know, for example, that life will survive up to 113 degrees uh, centigrade. But I think we're not through with that yet. We're going to find that it can live at much higher temperatures than that. We, we have found recently that life is living in Antarctica, in, in the ice. And deep down in the ice, in the Vostok core, there are cells that are living. Uh, a kilometer down in the ice. Um, we know that life lives in extreme acid environments. Rio Tinto in Spain is an example of, of one of the most extreme acid environments that we know of on Earth, and it's teeming with life. So, so life is everywhere we look. Uh, we used to say that life had to have liquid water all the time. Well, there, we now know that life can exist with just a tiny bit of water, a film of water on grains, even in, in the driest deserts in the world. There is life existing and, and uh, processing and f uh, making uh, food and so forth in, in, the, in these very dry desert regions. Dry deserts hot springs, underwater hydrothermal systems, polar regions, carbonic springs. Places that we thought sterile have turned out to be teeming with life. Biologists know the peculiar inhabitants of these hostile places by the name of extremophiles. Until quite recently, no one knew they were there. 
Now, by studying them, it may be possible for us to achieve a true understanding of biodiversity, the evolution of living beings, and biogenesis itself.